Hey guys, it's Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel. Today I am coming to you with a history chat about the Battle of Bosworth. Now, if I have done my math correctly, today is August 22nd. And on August 22nd in 1485, the Battle of Bosworth happened. And just by name recognition, you might not think the Battle of Bosworth was really anything of note. There are a lot of battles from the late medieval, early modern period that basically have kind of been lost to the sands of time. In terms of their importance, they seemed very instrumental at the time and have faded away for us in the modern day, except in a historical context. But the Battle of Bosworth is one that I think everybody should know, not just because this has to do with my favorite historical figure, Richard III, but the Battle of Bosworth in 1485 marks a very important point in history. For a lot of historians, uh, August 22nd, 1485 marks the end of the medieval period as a whole. For me personally, that's where I typically say the Middle Ages ended, is in 1485. Other scholars will tell you that was 1453 with the fall of the Eastern Roman Empire in Constantinople. Uh, so this is kind of a varied opinion piece, but certainly for England itself, it is the end of the Middle Ages. And that's for a wide variety of reasons. Uh, the Battle of Bosworth is where Richard III and Henry Tudor met on the battlefield. Richard III was defeated and killed in battle, and Henry Tudor rose to be Henry VII, the King of England. And so this is the last time in history when an English king fell in combat. Uh, it is also the birth of what we think of as the Tudor dynasty. Now, Henry VII today is not really thought of along the same lines of his son, Henry VIII, or Elizabeth I, even Mary I, or sometimes termed Bloody Mary. He is the member of the dynasty most often forgotten about. And I think that's a shame because certainly without him, we don't have the Tudor dynasty. The Battle of Bosworth is also typically talked about as the engagement that ended the Wars of the Roses. And the Wars of the Roses was essentially an English civil war that went on for a large part of the 1400s. Bosworth is the last major engagement in the Wars of the Roses, but there are several minor skirmishes and political dealings that happen during Henry VII's reign that I think fall under the umbrella of the Wars of the Roses. So Bosworth is really the last major engagement in the Wars of the Roses, and it's certainly the last time the Yorkists are able to field anything truly scary. Now, certainly Henry VII during his reign had a lot to be concerned about, and he was very worried about those Yorkist skirmishes, about people in his own court with Yorkist leanings. He worried about his wife, who of course was a Yorkist princess. Elizabeth of York was the daughter of Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville. So you might can imagine he was under a lot of stress in his own lifetime. Poor man, I just don't even know how he survived as long as he did, but the stress just didn't kill him uh, because he really, really worried about this. But it's funny that those skirmishes, the pretenders to the throne that came during Henry VII's reign, uh, that we don't really talk about them that much. For most people nowadays, Bosworth is it. The Wars of the Roses are done the second that Richard III is killed and Henry VII picks up the crown. Now, thinking about 1485, thinking about the lead up to the Battle of Bosworth, Richard III has been on the throne for two years at this point. And I would genuinely tell you that his reign has not been all that eventful. Uh, he's done some good things, and there's certainly been some controversies. He came to the throne in a very contentious way. Richard III is, let's call it like it is, he was a usurper. He usurped the throne from his nephews, who were the sons of Edward IV, his elder brother. Those nephews were the then taken into the tower. They were proclaimed bastards who had no legitimacy to the throne whatsoever, and they eventually disappeared. Many blamed Richard for this because the bodies were never produced, and that is an argument that, of course, has gone on into the modern day. We still argue about this. We still don't know what happened to the princes in the tower. Were they killed? Did they die of sickness? And clearly it's something that Henry Tudor, the future Henry VII, didn't know anything about either because 
pretenders claiming to be one of the princes in the tower constantly plagued him <laughs> throughout his reign. He had at least two, which is pretty wild, uh, considering that he could have said, Richard III killed them, we know they're dead, we've seen their bodies. Uh, so this is just not even something that they knew at the time. It was never clarified. It's not something where the information that they had has been lost to us now and it wasn't preserved correctly. They didn't know at the time. Also in Richard's reign, he has had to deal with some uprisings from a close friend, you might call him, the Duke of Buckingham. The Buckingham Rebellion happened early in Richard III's reign, uh, and that continued to produce difficulties for Richard socially and within the court. Henry VII kind of decides to play on these difficulties. He tried to make landfall a couple of times in the lead up to Bosworth and he was turned back because of weather at least once, uh, but he did manage to make landfall in Wales in 1485, which is his kind of historic homeland, the homeland of the Tudors. During the period of Richard's reign and even prior, Henry Tudor has been living in exile. Most recently, where he leaves from is Brittany in France. He had been there for a very long time and his army is made up of some might say predominantly mercenaries, French mercenaries. And something that's really interesting here that I don't know if they've ever proven how this happened is that you often hear in the Tudor period about something called the sweating sickness. It's something that just takes you like that. Within an hour of knowing you're sick, you are dead and gone. Uh, and it had not been in England prior to Henry VII landing with his army. Uh, and so a lot of people blame the French for the sweating sickness. A lot of people blamed Henry Tudor himself for the sweating sickness. I don't know if they've ever proven where exactly that disease came from, if it was something the French were already experiencing. But there's just an interesting fun fact for you. Henry Tudor has been in exile all of these years because he is essentially the last claimant to the Lancastrian line to the throne. Uh, so Richard III is, of course, from the Yorkist side of things. Henry Tudor is basically all that is left on the Lancastrian side. And this goes into a larger argument about whether or not Henry Tudor had a blood right to the throne of England. Uh, for me, he has a very murky claim. But winning at the Battle of Bosworth supersedes anything about blood right, in my opinion. He gained the throne by conquest. Uh, but this is something that also continues to plague Henry VII throughout his reign. I will link to down below Dr. Cat from Reading the Past recently did a video about Henry VII and his claim to the English throne. And I think she did it in a very nuanced way and she discussed both sides of the argument very interestingly uh, because some people believe right of conquest means nothing and it's all about blood right. Uh, but for me, he did come and win that battle. So he's the King of England. At any rate, Henry does land in Wales. Uh, his army is made up of a lot of Frenchmen and a lot of Welshmen. Uh, and so he starts to make his way over from Wales. Richard hears of this. He gets all of his men together and they meet in the middle at around a place called Bosworth Field. This is also still very contentious because you can go to the Bosworth battle site um, when I went to Leicester, I planned to go to Bosworth, but it was in August and they were having such extremely hot weather in England at that time. I think it was 86 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which is very, very hot for England when you have no air conditioning anywhere. And so I was advised not to go to the battlefield. And I'm very glad in a way that I didn't go. But it's interesting because apparently when you go to the battlefield and you talk to people there, you talk to the people at the Bosworth Museum, they will willingly tell you they think the spot where Richard was killed in particular is not on their land. Uh, so you can kind of go to a spot on the Bosworth battlefield and see a hill off in a distance that belongs to somebody else that is potentially where they killed Richard and is also actually just potentially the site of the battle itself. I don't think we will ever know that for sure. I know a couple of years ago, they were also planning on kind of putting a highway through the main Bosworth site or so people believe. And so there was a lot of argument against that. A lot of people signing petitions. The Richard III Society made a move to get this put in front of the government and say, please don't put this highway there because we know this is a place of historical significance. And I believe they won that if I'm not mistaken. But I think the others side kind of came back and said, well, we don't know for sure. 
that this is the battle site, so what does it matter? Uh, so there's been a lot of argument about that over the years. I think you'll find when it comes to Richard III in particular, and even Henry VII to a degree, they're very similar men, uh, there is a lot of argument. And there is just never an easy answer about anything. And such is the case with Bosworth. So Richard's side is about two or three times what Henry VII has at this battle. But what turns this for Richard is unfortunately, he made the choice to rely on some people who turned on him. Uh, and so this is the Stanley family. You might have heard of them if you were familiar at all with the Wars of the Roses period. The Stanleys are infamous during this period for waiting until they see a battle turn to join in. They want to know who is gonna win. There are two main brothers who essentially always used to split during the Wars of the Roses, one be Lancastrian, one be Yorkist. That way, no matter what, one of them was on the winning side. And what makes this such a big blunder for Richard, bless his heart, is that Thomas Stanley, the head of this force, is married to Margaret Beaufort, who is Henry Tudor's mother. So the Stanleys sit and wait a bit, and they wait to make their choice. And when they do make their choice, it is for Henry Tudor. And it is Stanley's men who they say killed Richard. Another interesting tidbit, another interesting fact about the Stanley family is that not a few years later, when one of these pretenders pretending to be one of the princes in the tower comes uh, during Henry VII's reign, there are plenty of people in England who totally support him uh, and totally believe, yes, he is one of the princes in the tower. He is the Yorkist prince. He is the true king of England. One of the Stanleys believes this too, and he is executed for it. Uh, one of the Stanleys who fought against Richard III at the Battle of Bosworth. Uh, so this is just still a cousin's war. You will often hear in the sources a lot of people at the time and a lot of people in about the century or so after the Wars of the Roses referred to it as the cousin's war because it was very much a war between families. And uh, the Lancasters and the Yorks, you go back far enough, they definitely are cousins. Uh, but this just goes to show that within the same family, people felt very differently, and apparently people felt very differently about Richard III himself. What is the fatal mistake for Richard is he kind of gambles all on making his way across the battlefield to kill Henry personally. He thinks he sees Henry across the field. He thinks he can get there. Uh, this is, of course, kind of the big famous moment in the Richard III play by Shakespeare, my horse, my horse, my kingdom for a horse. And you might say, like, why would anybody assume that was Richard himself going across the battlefield when it could have been any man in the Yorkist line? Like, why did people know that was Richard? Uh, people knew that was Richard because Richard rode into the Battle of Bosworth wearing a crown on his helmet. Yeah, he was that kind of diva. I love it. I just live for that detail. That's just absolutely the best thing about Richard III to me is that he rode into battle wearing a battle crown. Uh, now, this is not totally unusual for the medieval period. A lot of kings did this, uh, but Richard III did it as kind of a little bit cheeky. He wanted to die a king. This was very, very important to him. He wanted people on the battlefield to know who they were looking at. And unfortunately for him, I think it's one of many mistakes he made that day, but I just love the story of the fact that he wore a circlet into battle. I mean, that is just iconic to me. I, I love Richard III, but that's just really a detail about him that I love. When Stanley's men decide to join the fray is when he essentially decides to make this charge across the battlefield. So it is Stanley's men who surround him and kill him before he can get to Henry Tudor. In 2012, they discovered Richard III's body beneath a car park in Leicester. Uh, and so we do know now the extent of the injuries that Richard III sustained at the Battle of Bosworth and post-mortem. I'll try and link to a scientific article down below that kind of details the injuries that he went through. It is a little bit gruesome even though the pictures are of course of his skeleton uh, but they will tell you exactly what the injury was made with and potentially when it happened. Uh, the big injury is one to the back of his head, the back of his skull that looks like it was done by a halberd and so that kind of suggests by this point he had lost his helmet and so that of course could have been the blow that killed him, but he sustained many, many wounds. I believe he sustained at least 11 wounds and they know two of them were post-mortem. Uh, it's, it's gruesome. So since Richard lost his helmet technically before his death, the circlet rolled off and one of the soldiers picked it up 
and handed it to Henry Tudor on the battlefield. Uh, and so this is kind of a big iconic myth, I think, in Tudor mythos, is that he found it on a um, hawthorn bush, which eventually became part of his coat of arms. I don't think that's ever been confirmed, but somebody did bring Richard's crown, Richard's battle crown, to Henry VII. Henry VII is likewise a drama queen. Uh, so we have Richard riding into battle with his crown on so everybody knows who he is and knows that he is a king riding into battle. Then we have Henry VII dating his reign to the day before the battle. He dates his reign to August 21st. So essentially he can take down everybody who decided to fight for Richard on the day of Bosworth. I mean, have you just ever in your life, that is the most petty thing I have ever heard of and I love it. I live for it. The sad thing is, is that really in a different world, I think Henry VII and Richard III could have been friends because they're very similar people. They certainly had a similar background of being exiles. Uh, Richard was an exile as a child. Uh, so was Henry VII. Henry VII was an exile for the majority of his life. Uh, and they were also both termed usurpers in their own lifetime by people in their own court, by people who they knew, certainly by the people of England. They had to deal with that. And certainly they both were. I'm not going to cut anybody any slack here because certainly Richard was a usurper. He usurped the throne from his nephews. Henry Tudor usurped the throne from Richard III. It doesn't matter that he killed him on the battlefield. To a lot of people, that's still usurping. Uh, and I think also they both had really loving relationships with their wives and never cheated on their wives. I mean, it's just, and it's, it's sad to me because in a way, I do think that they could have gotten along. And I think in a way too, had Richard won at Bosworth, we would think of him similarly as Henry VII. I don't know that we would remember Richard III as vividly uh, if he had gone on to reign for as long as Henry VII, if he had gotten remarried, if he'd had more children, because of course, sadly, in the lead up to Bosworth, uh, Richard lost his only son and his wife in the months leading up to Bosworth. Uh, and so I think he was young enough, he was in his 30s, he could have gotten remarried, he could have had more children. And I think the kind of drama of the usurpation of his nephews, you know, that probably would have faded away. The Buckingham Rebellion, that likely would have faded away too. I am, of course, a really huge fan of Richard III, and I adore him. He is my favorite historical figure. Uh, but I think, arguably, I probably wouldn't rate him quite so highly had he lived through Bosworth or had he won. Had Bosworth never happened, certainly I don't think he would rate that highly for me. Uh, because there are other kings in English history who came to the throne through kind of murky means, who had different claims, and who we don't talk about to the extent that we talk about Richard. And I think we think of Richard and we remember Richard for three things. I think certainly we have to talk about Shakespeare. We definitely remember Richard at all because of Shakespeare. But there are plenty of other kings who Shakespeare wrote plays about that we don't think of as fondly or as negatively as we think of Richard III. Clearly, we also think of him because of the conspiracy about the princes in the tower. Did he kill them? Did somebody else do it? Were they doing it on his orders? Were they doing it to discredit him? Uh, I think this is a historical mystery that, of course, will never be solved. And it's one of the big reasons why we remember Richard. But I think the third and final reason is probably why his name has been cemented in history, and it's that he's the last king to die in battle. I really think had Richard reigned longer, we would have forgotten about him. Uh, I think a two-year reign, most of it peppered by these conspiracies, by people not trusting him, by people rising up and rebelling against him, uh, it makes for a very tumultuous drama, and it certainly gave Shakespeare a lot of fodder because had Richard won, we probably wouldn't have gotten a very unflattering portrayal of him in a Shakespeare play at all. But uh, I think Bosworth is important for a lot of reasons. I think certainly for me, it marks the end of the medieval period. It's the birth of the Tudor dynasty, and it is. It is the final time that an English king died in combat. Uh, and I think because Richard died in combat like that, there was a lot of change in how reigning was done. It was not so much anymore about being a warrior king. I think Henry VII was tired of that. He was tired of living his life in exile and soldiering and knowing that that's how he came to the throne. And so he did everything he could to make sure that his children didn't have to endure that. Uh, and so from then on, it's kind of a rarity to see an English monarch on the field of battle. 
Bosworth is a very poetic battle. Uh, certainly, I think the moment of picking up Richard's crown and handing it to Henry VII sounds like it is something straight out of Shakespeare, straight out of historical fiction, but it's something that happened. Down below, I will link to some resources about the rediscovery of Richard's body, uh, which has been extremely influential in the scholarship around Bosworth in particular and the Wars of the Roses at large because it has clarified a lot of things about Richard medically. And if you were in the UK and you ever get the opportunity to go, definitely go to Leicester. When I went to Leicester, it's so funny to me, when I went to Leicester, I had to take a cab from the train station to my hotel. And the cab driver asked me whether my company had booked the hotel for me because he didn't think it was a hotel and it wasn't. I was staying in a bed and breakfast, but he said, did the company book this for you? Because this is not really a hotel. And I said, well, I'm not here on business. He said, oh, why are you here? Uh, so <laughs> uh, maybe Lester doesn't rate quite highly in terms of tourism, uh, but they are very proud to have Richard. And when you go to Lester, you can see so much that he saw. It is mind blowing to me. You can just walk around and you will see all of these arches remaining from the city walls, Richard would have seen them. You can see where Richard stayed. You can go into the church that Richard is said to have prayed in before he left uh, to go to Bosworth to fight and be killed. And you can now see the spot where his body was found. The Richard III Center has been built over where that parking lot was, uh, and they have left it glass floored. And you can see with kind of um, a projection image where he was uh, in the church because he was buried in a church that no longer exists. He was buried in an unmarked grave in Greyfriars, which unfortunately dissolved, of course, when Henry VIII dissolved the monasteries. Uh, and so Richard III's final resting place was lost for centuries. Uh, it was very, very lucky that they found Richard in this spot and that they found him when they did. It's really amazing just how well things lined up for them to find Richard when they did. Uh, but like I said, I encourage you to go when we're not in a pandemic, especially if you're in the UK and you're very close to it, uh, do go and see it. I think it's just, I mean, it's really amazing. If you don't love Richard, maybe it wouldn't be that amazing to you, but uh, I do. So I was really happy to be in Leicester. So that's the Battle of Bosworth. I think this is the making of two men, even though it is essentially the death of one of them. This is, I think, partially why we find Richard so compelling. Uh, and it's certainly the making of a dynasty. And I encourage you too, if you're curious at all about the Tudors, to see where they started and to learn a little bit more about Henry VII because I really, really like him. He's somebody who's gotten a bad rep as the years have gone on because he was kind of talked about at the time as being rather miserly. Uh, and he's just not as exciting as Henry VIII. He didn't have six wives. I would love to hear your thoughts about Richard III and Henry VII down below, but like I said, that's going to be all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Goodbye.